HCAM programming is supported by viewers like you and by Star Realty, a real estate brokerage firm specializing in residential real estate sales in and around Hopkinton. Their agents live in town, send their children to Hopkinton schools, serve on local boards, volunteer for local causes, and frequent local business. Hopkinton is where they live, work, and give back. Star Realty. The future of the silo at the HCA, the Young Artists Exhibit, a visit to the Elmwood Gym, and highlights of a recent Foxwoods presentation. All this and more brought to you by Hopkinton's television station, HCAM TV. I'm Michelle Murdoch, and HCAM News starts right now. Hello Hopkinton and welcome to HCAM News for the week of August 5th. Hopkinton artist Marion Buff Spencer is back on site in the Elmwood Gym making repairs to the Boston Marathon mural she originally created in 2001. Due to water problems with the Elmwood roof, the mural, which depicts the entire marathon course from start to finish, showing major milestones along the way, was damaged and in need of repair. After consulting with Elmwood principal Dave Youngberg, it was decided that the best time to do the work was over the summer. Due to water damage, the paint in several areas of the mural had bubbled and Spencer has been sanding and preparing the cinder block surface for repainting. By the time students return in the fall, Spencer says the mural will be good, if not better, than when it was first painted. Another project is also underway at Elmwood this summer as the school is getting its new roof. The $1.1 million debt exclusion to fund the new roof was approved at the ballot by voters at a special town election in November of 2012. What have you been up to this summer? It's been a relatively slow summer for news in Hopkinton with many families away for the summer, but some of Hopkinton's residents are having fun at EMC Park. On a recent visit, the HCAM news camera caught several of those younger residents swinging, climbing, and bike riding with their friends. If you have photos of what you've been up to this summer and would like to share, send them to news at hcam.tv. And while summer on vacation and enjoying the slower days of summer, the school committee is back at work and will be holding a joint working session with the elementary school building committee next week. On Tuesday, August 13th at 7 p.m. in the fire station meeting room, the two committees will review updated projected enrollment figures from NESDEC, the New England School Development Council. The meeting is open to the public but will not be televised as it is a working session. The elementary school building committee has also been busy completing their scheduled site walk at Elmwood and Center School on Monday, August 1st. While open to the public, the majority of the participants were committee members and other officials including town manager Norman Kamalo and school superintendent Kathy McLeod. Today's site walk went well. Until now, we've seen these properties on uh, PowerPoint slides and online on maps. Uh, but it's a different experience when you actually walk the property and see it firsthand. So uh, that was the objective today, was to give the committee and our guests and the public that attended today the opportunity to see up close in person this, this land. And it's all part of our efforts over the summer to kind of keep that momentum going while we wait to hear back from MSBA and to develop our collective knowledge as a community about what some of the potential solutions might be to the constraints at Center School. We'll have more details and our full report on the site walk next week, so stay tuned for further updates. 
In other government news, town manager Norman Camalo invites residents to participate in the online version of Hopkinton's 2013 Citizen Survey. The deadline to complete the survey is Thursday, August 22nd. The feedback gathered will be used to help the town set benchmarks for service and to enable the selectmen to better set priorities. Next up tonight, we have some highlights from the July 24th presentation by Foxwoods to the town of Milford in which the social and economic impacts of the proposed casino were discussed. Some folks said, yeah, we do a lot of business, a lot of people live here. But who shops here? Who shops in our shops? Who goes to our restaurants? The downtown needs a revitalization. And Milford needs a revitalization. I was the first person to actually go into the storefront for uh, Foxwoods and met Mr. Allen. Uh, we had a nice cordial couple of hour discussion at which uh, at the end of it he said, uh, you seem like a straight shooter. I'm expecting that if you think I'm ever full of it, that you're going to call me on it. And tonight, Allen, I'm calling you on it. Okay. Um, frankly, um, Sid, you said that you had reviewed this report, yep. that, that this was the one that had not been reviewed by anybody else. Right. On page 13, um, Steve, I think you were talking about the reduction from 6 to 3.5% unemployment rate, which is a natural unemployment rate. The report actually says that that uh, will be 36 people from Milford who will be employed. It's a math error. Uh, my, my personal feeling is you had an intern do this report and they multiplied it by the wrong number, so instead of the five or 600 people getting employed, you have 36. That's what's in the report. My point here again is these things are being pushed out so quickly, they're not being vetted, and you've got inaccurate data here. I am for the casino, and I confess I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't know much about it, but uh, what attracts me is the jobs they will bring to town and probably the economy. And um, I know that there are a lot of people that uh, have different opinions than mine. And um, I think this is good, too, because we, uh, we all, uh, there is always, uh, it, it's always good to have opposition uh, so that we can check things put, uh, and get things right. I don't understand. When you do a study, don't you look at both sides? Are you to tell me that everything, everything that you told us that we have to believe is positive? There's got to be negative in there. There has to be. Has to be. When you, you, t you give me all these numbers, and I, I can't even begin to remember them all. I'm going to write them down. But when you say crime goes down, where are you getting all your research? We, I, get research from Connecticut, where Foxwoods is. Why aren't you giving us the research from there? One of the comments has been made that since, uh, I forgot what it was, eight or nine years of uh, Foxwoods, Connecticut being ex in existence, there has never been a major fire incident, therefore, we should assume there will never be a major fire incident at Foxwoods Milford. I think that is a dangerous and actually foolish assumption. I do find the number of 20 new students with 3,000 plus jobs coming in implausible. I do not think that is an accurate number. I work in a public school, not in the town of Milford, but I sit in an office and I see every day the kinds of kids that are coming into our school. They're not kids coming from two-parent homes, these 111 executive jobs that you're talking about. These are kids who have parents that live in two different homes, and these parents have to make the choice. Will my child go to school in one socket, or will my child go to school in Milford, where the other parent has now come to take a job in a casino? We have parents who are living with extended family. They can't afford homes on their own. They come and they live with relatives, and they join our schools. Whether they speak English, whether they don't speak English, it's numbers of kids. We've, we've spent a lot of time, energy, and money to uh, put together this presentation. Our goal here is to really serve the community. Uh, we called this meeting. This is our meeting. Um, we're here to learn about the social issues. Uh, 
you, you may have a problem with SIDS, but to be honest, it, it, it's not helping the outcome for, for us, for anybody in the audience. So take it offline, if you will, but we're I'm not really going to take it offline. And your name is Alan, is that correct? My name's Bob Allen, that's correct. Okay, Bob Allen, this may be your presentation. This is our town. I understand You're that. trying to come into my town on a $1 billion investment. We'd like to thank Milford TV for the use of their meeting video. And for those who are interested in watching the full meeting or any of the other three presentations recently made by Foxwoods, the meetings are available on Milford TV's YouTube site, My Milford TV. If you've driven by the Hopkinson Center for the Arts lately, you'll have noticed that phase two of the barn renovation project is underway. The fate of the silo, originally planned to be saved and attached to the new building, was discussed at a recent planning board meeting on July 22nd. While reviewing plans for the new barn at the Hopkinton Center for the Arts, the planning board discussed the silo and what would be done to it. The wood on the bottom of the silo has rotted over time, making it unstable. Chuck Joseph of the Hopkinton Community Endowment stated that it would not be refurbished like the new barn because it would serve no purpose to the art center. We're not going to spend any money on the silo because it serves no purpose for us. So I have people that are making private donations for an art center. I can't tell them where reskinning, resurfacing, whatever, um, an existing silo that has no bearing on the arts. Can't do it. Instead, the silo will be moved and attached to the new barn and will be stabilized during construction. We have agreed that we would stabilize it during uh, construction. We have agreed that we would reconnect it to the new building so that it is stabilized. And we have also agreed that we would do so in such a way that if the Historical Commission ever decided they wanted to move it again, they could detach it and move it. Board member Deb Thomas stated that she did not like the idea of keeping the silo and attaching it to the new barn unless it was refurbished. We have this beautiful new building structure and all that is going in here. And then we're going to have this silo that looks pretty bad and it's going to be like strapped up to the side of this beautiful new building and we don't have the ability to take funds that have been raised for an art center to refurbish a silo. I, I don't under, I, I frankly struggle with, with the, um, the logic behind this. I don't like the idea of, of keeping the silo unless the silo is going to be refurbished because I think it's going to detract from this um, center. Planning Board Chairman Ken Wisemantle agreed and suggested corresponding with the Board of Selectmen about the silo. I just remember the rot being so much more than a year ago, yeah. having looked at it. And, you know, if the town's owners of this, they're going to lose it. We can write a letter to the Board of Selectmen saying that we're, we as a board are concerned about the condition of, of the silo. One possibility for the silo is to have it restored in the future with some help by the HCE. I have talked to CPA and said, look, it, if you guys want to attack this in the future, we'd be glad to coordinate it, work with our architects, work with, on, on whatever is the most appropriate way to do that. Another possibility is to replace the old silo with a new one in order to preserve the symbolism of the original farm. To me, it is symbolic. Uh, historic, I think, takes a different view and says we want to keep that silo. That silo is not the original silo. I mean, you've got to be very clear on that. That is all pressure-treated, reinforced skeletal on the inside that in no way resembles the original silo. Um, the only thing that's original on it is some of the clapboard that's wood there. It would be a lot less expensive to build a new silo there and keep that symbolism of the Terry Farm but again, that's CPA and Historical's decision. That's not the endowment's decision. The silo is on town-owned land, and it is now up to the town to decide whether or not the original silo will be saved. Visitors to the children's room at the library on July 31st celebrated Harry Potter's birthday, and HKM News was there. In honor of Harry Potter's 33rd birthday, as well as his creator, author J.K. Rowling's 48th birthday, the library held a celebration.
The July 31st event featured magician Jungle Jim, who was there to teach the kids in attendance about how to become a Hogwarts wizard. If you guys think you have what it takes to be a wizard, let me hear you guys say, yeah! Yeah! I came up with the Harry Potter show, and initially it was just a Harry Potter theme, and then I said, what, if I was a kid, what would I want to do? And I would want to train to be in Hogwarts. And my goal is to get kids into the library all year round. So if I'm able to put on a really fun program that I, they identify with, um, with, with Harry Potter, with reading, with being at the library, um, they're going to come in, they're going to read. There's a whole generation of children, new children who are getting excited by um, J.K. Rowling's books. And um, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be able to encourage it. As part of the program, the kids, many dressed in wizard attire and waving wands, learned about what it takes to become a wizard at Hogwarts by performing several magic tricks. On the count of three, Wingardium Leviosa. Hands above your head, two fingers. One, two, three. Wingardium Leviosa! flower? You guys have been the star flower of Hogwarts. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Nice job, nice job. They also took part in a modified version of Quidditch, a popular game played in Harry's magical world. For both Jungle Jim and Coffin, Rowling has made an indelible mark on children's literature and the way that children read. The great thing about uh, Harry Potter books is that it's made a lot of kids read, and I think it's almost become a gateway for um, other other stories. And like kids are excited about reading. I do think that she has done a great service to readers and libraries and librarians and children all over the world because she's introduced characters that have made such a difference in people's lives and I think they will live forever. All right guys, you guys have passed Harry Potter Hogwarts Academy training. Give yourselves a big round of applause. For a full list of summer library activities, visit hopkintonlibrary.org. With this library update, I'm Stephanie Kane. In our next story, we'll meet three young artists whose work is currently on display at the HCA as part of the Young Artists Exhibit. Stephanie Kane is next with more. I am often very, very inspired by young artists' work because it's so fresh and um, full of imagination, both in the content and in the use of materials. For the first time, the HCA has opened up its gallery exclusively for young artists to display their work. The Young Artists Exhibit, currently ongoing until August 15th, features over 50 pieces of art from artists ranging in age from 5 to 18 years old. Someone popped in recently and said, oh, is this the high school art show? Because we do have that every spring, and I said, no, these are kids age 5 to 18. So I think it's pretty impressive. My mom suggested that I do it, actually. She really liked um, my uh, scratch art piece, so she thought I should show it in an art show. I really had fun creating these and having them actually be on display. It feels great because otherwise I'd probably would just be in my little studio that I have in my basement just kind of sitting there, so it's nice to have it up. It feels good to have my artwork on display because Not only is the exhibit a chance for these budding artists to showcase their work off in a public forum, but it also gave them an opportunity to have their work judged by professional artists as well as to discuss their work during a reception held on July 21st. I thought it would be great for the children to experience the whole gamut of entering a show and getting their work judged and having it on the walls and coming to a reception and having to talk about their work because that's a really hard thing to do. It was lovely to see so many little kids here and share, talking about their work, being so excited. It was just very inspiring to see so many young artists here with their families and their friends sharing all of the work that they've created. The artists were just beaming. McDonald's piece Silver Wolf won first place in the 5 to 12 age group category and Neelan's trio of photographs Shedding Skin won first place in the 13 to 18 age group category. I was not expecting to win at all. There's so many great other works here. In art class she had us, it was a picture from a calendar and so she had a lot of animal pictures and this one was my favorite so I decided to do it. and. First, I had to sketch it out before I actually did the final piece. I just think it's such a wonderful show, and I hope that 
many, many people come see it. Waldman, who was very pleased with the response to the exhibit, plans to make it a yearly showcase. For more information about the exhibit, visit the HGA's website at hopartcenter.org. Reporting for HCAM News, I'm Stephanie Kane. Summertime is camp time, and here in Hopkinton, for those who like horses, there's the Woodville Trailbusters 4-H Horse Club at Checkerberry Farms. I love seeing the kids that have never sat on a horse, sit on a horse, and think, wow. And for Sue Lukey, leader of Hopkinton's 4-H club, the Woodville Trailbusters, she gets to experience that joy during a camp she runs at her house at Checkerberry Acres Farm each summer, where she and several trailbusters teach those not in the club about horseback riding and how to properly care for a horse. My goal is to get children to enjoy horses, but also know that it's not just hopping up and taking a ride, that there's a lot more involved. So what do we do first? Good job. Then what do we do? Take the girth off. No, it's not the girth. Start to the H. Halt. Halt Halter. Yeah. Take the halter. Okay. Now what do we do? Yep. Now what do we do? Yeah, over her ear. One ear? Both. Both. My favorite part is probably working with the kids because it's fun to see how much they light up when they work with the horses. I always wanted to ride a horse so I like seeing other kids be happy when they get to ride. As part of the camp, participants were able to ride horses in both the fenced-in area, where they learned how to trot, as well as on the trail for a scavenger hunt. Not only were the campers able to interact and learn about horses, but the other animals on the farm, including ducks and rabbits. Lukey started the Trailbusters in 1986 and has been leading the club ever since. My daughter, of course because of my love, has a love for horses, and I thought, well, I should do it with her. So I started that, was going to end it when, she's 34 years old now, I was going to end it when she graduated from high school, I was going to end it when she graduated from college, I was going to end it when she got married, but I'm still here 27 years later. Not only does the club focus on taking care of horses, but other animals as well. The Trailbusters also participate in several fairs and competitions throughout the year. There is also a community service and crafts component to the club as well. You don't have to own a horse or even want to touch a horse. I've had kids that just wanted to learn about horses and it took a good year before they even wanted to touch or sit on a horse. I love working with animals. It's my favorite thing to do. And working with horses is the best part of it, I think. It's just the, the camaraderie of joining a club and promoting something. For more information about the Trailbusters, visit their website at woodville4h.tripod.com. Reporting for HCAM News, I'm Stephanie Kane. And now, before we sign off, Courtney Taylor is next for a look at what's playing on HCAM this week with the latest HCAM Insider. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the HCAM Insider News Segment. On Monday, August 5th at 7 p.m., Bill Duncan takes the stage to play his original songs for the Wake Up and Smell the Poetry audience. Just run till you get to some place safer where nobody can hurt you when you know you're out of danger. Just run till you know you're free from harm where hope will not desert you when there's no cause for Run. During a new physician focus at 8.30 p.m., Dr. Naomi Simon discusses the causes and symptoms of complicated grief and what kind of help is available. Complicated grief uh, really can be thought of in the way that we think about medical complications, um, that there is a complication that interferes with grief progressing along the usual pathway. On Tuesday, August 6th at 9.30 p.m., Dr. Yoko Yarakaris discusses the development of diabetes in the United States and ways to combat and treat the disease during the latest edition of the Hopkinton Drug Lecture Series. On Wednesday, 
August 7th, Center School Principal Lauren DeBeau discusses her history in the teaching profession and talks about how she came to Hopkinton during this episode of All About Hopkinton. The position was posted for principal. I had been acting principal. I had taught most of the levels of the school. It was a preschool through grade two school. I had led them through some challenging experiences. I knew where we needed to move forward and I became a bit territorial. I didn't want anyone else to do it. So I did um, seek that position so that I have held since 2007. During the latest Concerts on the Common on Thursday, August 8th at 7.30 p.m., the Hopkinton Community Summer Band plays for the crowd at the Town Common. Remember that you can have this information sent to you every week in the HCAM Insider Newsletter. If you already receive it, please pass it along and help us grow. As always, thanks for watching HCAM. Now back to you, Michelle. And that wraps up this week's edition of HCAM News, keeping Hopkinton up to date with the latest local happenings. I'm Michelle Murdoch, and for the HCAM News team, that's your news, Hopkinton. Smile.